This video will discuss the mean free path, or the average distance that a gas particle travels before colliding with another gas particle. Okay, so let's imagine we have some gas particle. So we got some nucleus or, or a collection of nuclei inside this circle. Let's assume that we have an approximately spherical molecule. So we got some effective radius or diameter of the particle, d. So I got the orange circle. So if any particle comes within, uh, comes within its orange circle, so the orange circle of another particle goes inside the orange circle of this particle, that'll count as what's called the collision. The particles will collide with one another and alter their trajectories. So let's say we have one particle here. It has some velocity u. So it has its, its effective uh, radius there around it in that orange circle. So if any particle, if the center of that particle is inside this uh, kind of this volume here that we're sweeping out as we're moving, which is going to be inside uh, twice the radius of that particle, then as this particle is moving through space, if these particles stay inside this volume, then what we're going to do is this particle is going to collide or it's going to hit this particle. If its nucleus is outside this volume, the particles will miss each other, but anytime it's inside, it's going to hit. Anytime it's outside, they're going to miss. <clears throat> okay, so as I said there, if the distance between the two particles is less than the diameter of the particle, or two times the radius of the particle, the two particles are going to collide. So how many collisions are going to occur uh, due to the particles moving through space? So the number of collisions that a particle is going to have is going to equal the volume that it's sweeping out as we go times the density of the particles. So the volume that we're sweeping out with this tube here, that's equal to the cross-sectional area of this tube times the length of it. So what is the uh, cross-section, so the cro yeah, cross-sectional area of this curve, which we call sigma, and what is the length or the height of this cylinder that we're sweeping out? So the height of this cylinder is equal to the velocity of the particle times the time it's traveling, which is equal to its average velocity times the time that it took to travel this distance. So the volume that it sweeps out is the cross-sectional area times its velocity times the time, and the density of the particles we'll leave as rho for now. Okay, so uh, d n call, that's the number of collisions that the particle undergoes from time t to t plus dt. All right, so this volume, as I said, is equal to the cross-sectional area of the particle times h sigma times u dt, sigma being the cross-sectional area of the particle. If it's perfectly spherical, that's going to be pi times diameter squared. If it's not spherical or some other shape, uh, it'll be some different function, but in any case, it'll always be some effective area of the particle based off of its dimensions. Okay, we can define another quantity called the collision frequency. So that's the part, that's the derivative of the number of collisions with respect to time, or the rate at which occur, the collisions occur over time. So that's going to be uh, substituting in some values here, sigma times rho, and then we divide it by dt, so that's gone. The only thing left over is the average velocity, which from our previous video on the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is equal to the square root of eight times gas constant times temperature divided by pi times the molar mass of our particle. Or if we replace r and m with k and little m, we have a sigma rho square root of eight times Boltzmann constant times temperature divided by pi times the mass of an individual gas particle. Okay, so we have the mass there, but what if, what if these other particles can move too, as we know that they will? So what we're really interested in is not actually the average velocity of an individual particle of a mass m. What we're interested in is actually the relative velocities of these two particles. How fast are they traveling fast uh, relative to one another. So the relative velocity of it we get using the 
what is called the reduced mass of the two particles. So the reduced mass of two particles is equal to the product of their masses divided by the sum of their masses. So mu equals m1 m2 over m1 plus m2. So in this case, if we're assuming that these are two gases of the same part, two particles of the same gas, then m1 equals m2 and mu equals m over 2. So here we'd be replacing the velocity of a particle with the relative velocity of two particles, replacing m with mu. Uh, m mu equals m over 2. So what we it's inside a square root as well. So we can factor out a square root of 2, which m over 2 puts a 2 in the numerator. So we can factor out a square root of 2. Uh, the relative velocity of the two particles equals the square root of 2 times the velocity of one of them. So our collision frequency now of a given gas particle, Za, is equal to the square root of 2 times the density of the gas particles times the cross-sectional area of those particles times the average velocity of the particles. Okay, so now if we look at the density of our gas, density is equal to the number of particles divided by the volume available to them. If our gas is ideal, then this is going to be equal to, from the ideal gas law, Avogadro's number times pressure divided by the gas constant times temperature, if we have an ideal gas. Okay, so now let's look at another quantity that we can calculate here called the mean free path. So the collision frequency tells us how many collisions we have per unit time. The mean free path tells us what is the average distance we travel between collisions. So if we know our average velocity and we know the frequency of our collisions, then the length that we travel between collisions is just our velocity divided by the frequency of those collisions. So that is going to be equal to, is equal to uh, u expectation value divided by ZA is square root of 2 rho sigma u. The u's are going to cancel, so this is independent of the velocity of the particles. So it's 1 over the square root of 2 times their density times the cross-sectional area of the particle. So we saw here that density is equal to n over v. So 1 over rho is equal to v over n. So one metric we can use for the mean free path of a given particle in an ideal gas is that it's the mean free path is equal to the volume of the system divided by the square root of 2 times the cross-sectional area of the gas particle times the number of particles. So that's okay if we know the size of the system, if we know what the volume is and we know how many particles there are, but sometimes we don't know that. Sometimes we just know the temperature and pressure. So sometimes it's more convenient to substitute V and N for uh, N over V being Avogadro's number times P over RT. So equivalently, we can say for an ideal gas that the mean free path equals RT over square root of 2 times Avogadro's number times cross-sectional area sigma times the pressure. So there's different metrics we can uh, use there for uh, the mean free path depending on what we know about the system. Those are equivalent to one another. Um, one thing we haven't mentioned is where we would get this diameter or the cross-sectional area of a particle. Sometimes those are things you could look up in a table. So for example, if you have a monatomic ideal gas like helium or neon, you could look up something like the van der Waals radius of that particle. Um, it's easier when the particles are more spherical, when they have a more uh, larger globular shape to them, it's harder to do. So sometimes there's just, uh, you can derive kind of an effective value of this uh, for certain particles, but you might be able to find them in tables, otherwise you might just have to kind of come up with some effective guess which you think is a pretty good approximation to what this value should be.